Right, good afternoon everybody and a very warm welcome to you. This is Natalie from Retail New Zealand and um, I'm joined here today by my colleague and uh, business advisor here at Retail NZ, Ashley Waterman and Ashley um, is sitting in really on, on this webinar and she will assist me uh, at the end to uh, address some of the questions that, that come through. So a really warm warm welcome. We've got about 30 minutes together today and um, we're really going to try and cover as much ground as we possibly can. So um, you will see on your screen that you will have a question or a chat feature up on your screen. So please do use that as questions arise for you. Please type them in there and Ashley and I will address those at, uh, as, the, uh, as the session uh, draws, draws down. Um, if we don't get to answering all your, your questions, um, by the end of the session, we will certainly send out an FAQ sheet or we will actually make contact with you directly. Um, for Retail NZ members, also please remember that after this, if you still do have questions that are not answered for you in the session today, you are very welcome to call the 0800 472 472 advice line and um, we will assist you and address some of those specific questions that you have um, that, that come up for you during the session today. So just to really head off, I don't, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that coronavirus has been termed a global health emergency by the World Health Organization. And I have no doubt that questions on retailers' minds is what does this mean for my business? At this stage, while it appears that there's no need for New Zealand businesses to panic, it's certainly a really good idea to be thinking about the potential impacts of this on your business. And to be perfectly honest, this is a moving, targ a moving target and without a really accurate crystal ball, it's really hard to say where this is likely to go. But really our objectives for the session today is uh, we want to have a look at a couple of things and I'm sure these are things that are in your mind as well. Um, what are the things to consider? Certainly supply chain issues, health and safety obligations to employees and customers and how you'll manage the impact um, of quarantine staff and the resulting staffing issues coming out of that with regard to staying within the lanes of employment law. And that's one of the reasons why I've got Ashley here today because we want to be sure to give you as accurate information as we possibly can as you navigate what is um, laws that are already in place but there might be some nuances and certainly this I think has thrown a little bit of a curveball in there for us. So together uh, we want to get this right and certainly be there to support you our, our members as well. Um, lastly, there is of course the question of the possibility of a downturned economy and how do we actually go about recession proofing our businesses as retailers. So it's very hard to say what the final outcome of this outbreak will be compared to other epidemics or pandemics that we have seen in the past, such as SARS, Ebola, Zika and other things like that. So probably the best place to start is with what do we know? Already we know that there's been a significant reduction in international travel and um, with the closure of some ports and so on, we know that our supply chains have certainly been, been stunted. Already we've got some figures through, some retailers are, retailers are reporting a negative impact in moving products which are particularly aimed at the international visitor market. Uh, numbers that we have are ranging between about 14 and 30% reduction in both foot traffic as well as in store sales. Um, a little bit of good news on that front though is, is that um, online sales appear to be largely unchanged at this point. And so certainly if you've got an e-commerce platform, um, you want to be keeping that up to date and um, as vibrant and busy as you can. And if your business hasn't looked at that, that's maybe something to really be considering um, at this, this stage while of course uh, things are still seeming to be unchanged in, in that space. A small number of our retailers have already reduced their staffing complement as a result of the reduced demand and the re reduced forward orders. But at this stage, um, there really is no reason to close stores and the Ministry of Health has said that they will advise if this does become necessary. So I think just for, um, for as business owners, it's really important just to keep things in perspective. Um, we can't gloss over the fact that we know a significant amount of people have 
diet. Um, but what's far less widely reported is that far more people are actually recovering from this COVID-19 virus that we're seeing. And um, that, you know, there's a lot more people who are actually recovering from it than those who have succumbed to it. So that's certainly something to keep in the back of your mind. We hope that um, you know, there are a lot of medical people actually working on some breakthroughs. And so hopefully we will see an end to this or certainly that it's brought under control um, quite quickly. So what are some of the supply chain issues? I mean, really to state the obvious, there are very few retailers who can operate if they don't have stock. I mean, that just goes without saying. Um, and most of us are reliant either directly or indirectly from goods which are imported from China. Even manufacturers who retail their own product or who are supplying um, other retailers are likely to have some materials or components that they are relying on, ch on China for. So in terms of the median term outlook, um, there certainly are some supply chain concerns, particularly for those businesses who are sourcing their product from mainland China. So we are seeing some delays um, in, in uh, product orders. We're also seeing some cancelled orders due to the factory shutdowns and of course there are the, the closed or the retarded port operations that we need to consider as well. So the question for you really is, is are there suppliers outside of China? I'd really encourage you to be doing your research and to be having those conversations. And most importantly, you need to be communicating. Think about what are the practical steps with regard to communicating with your suppliers as well. Um, you know, the questions to be asking is what, what uh, suppliers do they have? What delays are they ex expecting? Is there a possibility for you to stockpile some goods as well? Uh, if so, it's really important to think about what that look lo looks like in terms of your cash flow. You want to be thinking really carefully about the products that you do stock stockpile. Um, for example, are they definite sellers and do they have some good margins in them because you don't want to be tying up unnecessary funds and things that might sit around for a few months before you can actually move them on. Uh, I did have a conversation yesterday actually with an organisation uh, called Composite Retail, which I have no doubt some of you are probably members of anyway, if you don't know them. They are a retail co cooperative and they, they work pretty much as a buying group. And um, it was very interesting, the gentleman I spoke to there, Russell, said that they are actually looking at alternative suppliers and uh, Turkey is certainly one of the countries that they're looking at, so that might be something for you to look in. Um, and I did ask Russell, I said, do you guys know where you're going with this? And he said, look, at the moment, it's as much a moving target for them as it is for anybody else um, that is operating in this environment. But he certainly said that he'd be happy to, uh, to have a chat with any of our members. So if you did want to look them up, that would be Composite re Retail and the person to speak to there would be Russell. So of course, the next thing that I'm sure you have on your mind is what are the implications and what are the things to consider in terms of health and safety and employment law considerations? The Health and Safety um, Act of 2015 says that you as the employer have a duty of care to eliminate, minimise risks and hazards to your workers and others who come to your workplace as fa so far as is reasonably practicable. Now, this may be speaking to workers, providing some information around basic hygiene standards, as you would do in a normal uh, flu season. But as a business, you probably also need to be thinking about carrying out some risk assessments and have some plans in place to protect your workers' health and safety. And you need to be thinking about what's your plan B? Are there others who can step in if I do end up with quite a few people off work or in quarantine, for example? The most obvious risks, obviously, is if workers have come into contact with the virus um, or haven't been exposed to it in some way, if they've traveled, for example, recently. And the question to be asking is, is, as a business, can I sustain periods of people working from home or working remotely or work, not working at all? And I think largely for 
many of us as retailers, one of the big things you'll be thinking about is a lot or a big portion of your staff complement are in fact staff facing. So you need to be thinking about what are some of the things you can put in place over there? Are there other people who can step in? Do you have some other part-time workers who could potentially pick up more hours? What are the things that will be specific to your uh, specific situation? We do know uh, that we have some of um, our members as well who've got workers who have been stood down um, as a precautionary member, uh, as a precautionary measure, on a, either on a voluntary basis or. Um, as a matter of, of having to be quarantined. I'm sure all of you know by now that this quarantine period is about 14 days, particularly for people who have returned from uh, China and who've potentially come into contact with the virus. And so while this mitigates the health and safety risk, it also raises a number of employment considerations for when you are looking at uh, running a business. So you know the old adage, if you fail to plan, you certainly are planning to fail. So our recommendation is, is have a look at your unique situation and start planning. Think about all the eventualities of how this virus could potentially affect your business. You want to be looking at your current policies. Are they fit for purpose? Is it necessary to revisit those or amend those? And if you do, to just um, to bear in mind that you probably need to be just routinely re-evaluating those as more information uh, comes to light around this. And it's really important to take um, some practical and reasonable approaches to your employees and your business and to tailor this to suit your specific situation and to really be able to respond proactively. Employees have obligations to comply with reasonable policies that employers impose. So now is the time really to review your policies, your employment agreements and your health and safety obligations. Um, and if you are a member of uh, Retail NZ, also remember that if you come up against something you really don't have the answer, there is the advice line. We've got an amazing team of people who are on standby, ready to uh, help you navigate and work through any of those um, particular issues which you may have. Um, and it's it's a bit, a, a lot of this will be um, new ground for, for us as well, but together um, we can actually help you to work through some of those uh, considerations and concerns. I think it's really important to remember as well that consultation really underpins all good employment relationships. So be providing regular updates and um, and you know information as it comes to to hand for your employees that will really be be paramount to cementing some of those good relationships there as well. Employees also need to know that their employers have plans and contingencies in place um, and that they will be protected if there is an epidemic in New Zealand. So, and this really starts to look at some of those uh, health and safety obligations, particularly in relation to providing a psychologically safe uh, workspace for, for your employees. But I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Probably some easier things to address in terms of health and safety is just some practical considerations. And honestly, there's not very much we can do at this stage. Um, the Ministry of Health has some really good information available um, regarding workplace infectious disease prevention. And these really boil down to, right at the moment, some practical things that you can, can do. Just providing some visual reminders for your staff, have some posters displayed, just about correct hand washing procedures. And it's, this is really not necessarily common knowledge or common sense for everybody. So don't think that just, you know, it'll be silly putting things like that up. A good reminder is, um, it's just pertinent for everybody just to be reminded and to think about, have I really washed my hands correctly? What does this mean in terms of not only my own health and safety, but other people um, in my workplace as well? 
uh, and really talk to your people about the importance of this. Open those lines of communications and just other things as really simple things as well. Make sure that in your washrooms or, or in your, your toilets and your bathrooms, you have actually supplied things like liquid soap. I was in a, uh, walked into um, a, a workplace the other day and they had um, really good uh, information up on the wall about correct hand washing procedures, but then they actually had no liquid so soap and, and some good uh, clean disposable towels available. Uh, so make sure that you've, you've done everything that you can to provide for people to be able to do that. Um, there are lots of things out there at the moment and certainly at the end of this when we send out our, our FAQs we will be sure to provide some links for you to make that easier for you as well. Now, in terms of psychological safety, you will know that when the Health and Safety Act was re reviewed back in 2015, there was a little bit more emphasis placed on your duty of care as an employer to provide a uh, not only a physically safe, but also a psychologically safe working environment for people as well. So in terms of this, there's a lot of misinformation and conspiracy theories out there that are certainly playing on people's fears. And so good information is really a fantastic de-escalation um, tool. Check the source of, of information, set people right if they uh, are veering down, down a wrong track, because that in and of itself can really go a long way just to I suppose just really put people at ease um, and so yeah really good information is is key and and paramount now for some of your employees the situation coronavirus is just not going to be a worry while for others they may really suffer significant stress as a result of feeling that they might be in a situation where there is risk now whether that risk is actually real or it's perceived the stress is a real issue for those people so if you do have an EAP provider this is really a good time just to remind your employees that they can speak to somebody confidentially um, it's really a great service that helps you to fulfill your health and safety obligations to provide a safe, psychologically safe workplace for your team. If you don't speak to us again here um, at Retail NZ, we do um, partner with an EAP provider and their services are available to our members at a significantly reduced cost. So definitely, um, if you have some people who's uh, psychological safety you are a little bit concerned about, do give us a call and we can put you in touch with some people who can help you. Once again, communication is key, but of course remember that the message is caution and not panic. Great cultures drive great businesses. So you do far better to create a sense of community and looking out for one another and encouraging your staff to be looking out for one another again. And it's a fantastic base if you're really wanting to promote engagement, motivation, loyalty to your business. And you will actually see that once you start moving into changing your culture, you will see your levels of productivity um, shift up a notch as well. So certainly a good space for you to not only be fulfilling your obligations, but to actually um, moving your team to where they can be a whole lot more uh, product productive and um, certainly in the climate that we're in that can't be a bad thing. Where you are faced with um, employees who are returning from China and who are not able to work or even people that have come back from, um, from traveling abroad, um, you will have some employees that are concerned about the potential spread of the environment, uh, of the virus rather. And so you need to be thinking in terms of information. What is it that you can tell people? Information is power and it can also really be your friend in this situation. So you want to keep your people informed as best as you can, but also remember it's really important to remain within the parameters of the Privacy Act. Um, and so again, we will send out a link when we send out the FAQs so that you are um, confident in what you can actually um, let people know in terms of what's actually happening for their, um, for their colleagues. Managing people who are sick, uh, keep in touch and up to date with staff members who are off sick, encourage anyone who displays symptoms similar to flu symptoms and encourage them to stay home and, and recover. Be thinking about your plan B, winter is fast approaching um, and whether it's a cold, flu or 
COVID-19, um, have a solid plan in place to get through this winter. You should advise six staff members who have symptoms of the coronavirus and specifically those who have traveled in the past month to definitely phone the uh, health line. That 0800 number should be up there on your screen at the moment, or at least uh, to make contact with a, a GP just to hear what it is that they should do, because it's not only their health and safety, but it's also you need to be thinking of um, the potential risk to the other uh, people in your organization as well. So let's just get down to some of the nitty gritties and maybe these are some of the more burning questions that might be sitting on top for you. When is an employee, of course, entitled to take sick leave? Um, employees who are sick or who need to care for a spouse or a dependent who is sick, they are entitled under the Holidays Act to paid sick leave. The minimum statutory entitlement at the moment is five days, and this can be um, accumulated up to 20 days. Now, if you watched uh, TV news last night, you will know that there is talk that this is possibly going to be reviewed just to um, accommodate people under our current situation that's facing us. And of course, look at your employment agreement. You might have agreed to uh, the fact that people might have some more leave entitlements at your particular organization. So you just want to make sure that there's a law on one side, but if you've got anything that is in an employment contract that will actually supersede um, that. And of course, it's up to you. You can exercise some discretion in this particular time if you uh, can extend more leave to people who are affected by this. Once an employee's sick leave entitlement is exhausted, uh, an, employer, an employee may wish to take up some paid annual leave in order to ensure consistent income because this is going to be a worry for, for people. Uh, when do I get paid? When don't I get paid? What's it going to look like for me on a, on a personal level? So again, the parties can agree to this, but an employer should not automatically place an employee on paid annual leave without the employee's consent. And once the annual leave is used up, assuming that the employer does not allow the employee to take annual leave in advance, there is no obligation on the employer to pay the employee for any further time um, taken off work due to sickness. So pretty much to sum that up, it's sick leave first, then it's annual leave with consent in the second instance, and thirdly, you might have to look at um, unpaid leave or if you have any other contingencies in place to, to manage that. Uh, a question that is coming up as well is, is, do you need to pay an employee who chooses vol voluntary quarantine? There will be situations where employees are off work because they've been exposed to the risk of infection, but neither are they actually infected or sick. So this could be like a quarantine period after someone has traveled. Now, as a general rule, the employee is not entitled to paid sick leave if there is no identifiable illness or injury. However, these are special circumstances, and you may want to consider this as sick leave under these circumstances. The reason being this, if you choose not to pay for such an absence, the employee may feel that they have to attend work after all, because people are, they're going to be concerned about their own financial situation as well. So you've got to be thinking about their thinking as well. So before you make a decision not to pay employees, you should ensure that you have a clear understanding of the extent of the risk that may be posed by that employee attending work. Again, you want to be exploring if there are some other options available. Is it possible for this person to work from home or some other suitable arrangement? So consider your obligations to other people in your workplace who may be impacted. And any agreement that you may come to with a staff member, be sure to record this in writing, even if it is just simply by a text or an email. Okay, what if you've got an employee who is under compulsory quarantine? Do you have to pay them? What is the circumstances around that? The employee 
in this instance would be not ready, willing or able to work. So a starting point for this would therefore be that the employee is not entitled to be paid. But once again, before an, employee, an employer decides not to pay, it really needs to consider other options such as working from home or working different hours or taking other measures to avoid personal contact. The employer and the employee may also agree to the employer using other entitlements such as sick leave or annual leave, once again, as we've discussed before. And while you may want to do the best for your employees and assist them where possible, payment will not always be a viable option, particularly if this situation is going to be widespread or reoccurring. So I think that's probably a bit of a moving target there for all of us as well. Now the question is always, you're gonna have some mavericks and they'll be sick as dogs and they want to attend work anyway. You have an obligation as an employer under health and safety to protect the health of all your employees to prevent illness. So it's not unreasonable for you to request that a staff member um, goes home if they are, if you can really see as well that they're not well so that they can actually recover and prevent putting other people at risk. If they don't have any available sick leave entitlement, again, you can discuss with them what options there are, whether that be um, unpaid leave or um, an alternative uh, a leave arrangement which might be available. In general terms, if an employee is ready, willing and able to work, the employer, the employer is obliged to provide that employee with work. But an employer may want an employee who is suspected of having come into contact with the virus to stay away from work and so as not to pose a risk to other people in your workplace. In our view, an employer will be entitled and perhaps even obliged under the Health and Safety Act at work um, to direct that employer not to come into work at all. If there is a risk of general infection or if the workplace is unable to function effectively due to employee absence, an employer may also be justified in closing down a workplace altogether. A key issue for employers in those circumstances will be whether absent but healthy employees are in fact entitled to be paid. Again, this is why it's really important to be looking at the policies that you currently have in place. Okay, um, is an employer obliged to pay an employee? It requires, so if the employer requires a, a staff member to stay away, what are the circumstances then? Some employment agreements contain clauses that excuse payment where an employer requires the employer to stay away. However, generally speaking, if the employer decides that the employee must stay away, the employee is entitled to be paid so long as the employee is ready, willing and able to work. Some employers it might be able to rely on a force majeure type of clause um, if this is in your um, employment contract. This will usually release a party from its contractual obligation to pay an employee or provide them with work when an extrinsic event uh, like the coronavirus, for example, um, makes it possible to, um, to actually um, perform that employment agreement. And, but if your employment agreement does not contain such a clause, the doctrine of frustration of contract may provide some relief, but that can be quite difficult to navigate. So again, have a chat with someone here in our offices, or it may even be that you need to um, have a look and go down um, a road where you might need to consult with an employment lawyer. Can you, as the employer, require an employee to undergo medical testing? In short, the answer to that question is no. Employees must consent to medical testing. An employer would most likely be justified in requiring an employee to stay home and not paying them if that person refused to take a test to confirm infection. So where there is a reasonable chance of that having occurred. So maybe they've been away and you are concerned about that and they don't want to have a test, um, you, you could be justified in that. So in other words, if someone is showing symptoms and you ask them to see a doctor and they refuse, you could ask them then to stay home and not have to pay them for that time. 
I'm just looking at our time over here, and I hope to keep this within the 30 minutes, but um, there is still some ground to cover, so we will push push through, um, and uh, yeah, just hope this information is actually really helpful to you. Um, what about asking employees to take annual leave? So again, the Holidays Act requires that um, you negotiate with an employer and that you both both parties actually agree. Um, and if you cannot reach agreement, um, then that there needs to be a 14-day notice period. So you can ask them to take leave, but you do need to give them a 14-day notice period. In this instance, we know that the incubation period and the quarantine period that we're looking at is about 14 days. So with the coronavirus, this is really not actually a viable option. So again, it's wise to negotiate this with a staff member and bearing in mind that they can refuse. The only other option may uh, need to be unpaid leave if they choose not to use their annual leave entitlement. Now, for some of your employees, depending on their role, uh, travel might be a part of their day-to-day -day work that they do. So the question is, is what if I have staff who are traveling? Some of your staff may be really reluctant to travel at this point. Um, but can you as an employer insist on your employee traveling to a non-affected area, for example? The employer can certainly issue a lawful and reasonable instruction, but would have to take into account the employee's position before deciding what to do. So there will be some competing considerations um, that need to be weighed up, but ultimately, if the risk does not exist, then any refusal to work may uh, justify some form of disciplinary action. But under the health and safety, your staff can actually refuse to work if they deem the environment to be a dangerous one. So you just want to exercise some caution in this regard. Again, have a conversation with us. Certainly be having some um, conversations with the staff members that are affected by this as well. Um, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs has some really uh, good and useful information on their website as well with regard to safe travel. That should be up there on your screen at the moment, so certainly be sure to, to check out that website as well. No doubt a lot of you will have staff and employees who have children, particularly school-going children. Uh, there is already talk of some school closures or children being made to stay home to, minim to minimise the risk of infection, uh, in which case some employees may also need to stay home to care for their children, whether they are sick or not. So again, under the um, Health Act of 1956, a medical officer can actually instruct that an educational facility be shut down or a part of that facility be shut down. And if that does happen um, and people don't comply with that, they do actually stand to be fined up to a $2,000 fine. So very tricky position for employees and employers. How do we navigate this? So if you have staff who do have school going children, you need to think about how you will make accommodations for this as well. Now, if the child is sick, the employee is entitled to paid sick leave, at least until that leave runs out. However, if the child is not sick, the employer will not be obliged to pay that employee who needs to stay home to care for the child. The employer and the employee can, of course, agree to different suitable arrangements, um, and but just ensure that, of course, that this is in line with any employment agreements that you do have set up. So the question is, is where do we go to from here? Um, be proactive, consider your situation, um, and each situation is likely to be unique. So what's your response going to be? Bearing in mind that the situation is likely to be continually uh, evolving. Develop your policies to address these sorts of questions, and most importantly, get some buy-in from, from your team. This is a community issue. And I know for a fact that if you start engaging and talking to your team, there'll be some great ideas and solutions that they may actually have that you might not even have considered. Um, and again, you know, just be sure that your policies, any new policies that you put in place as well, are sufficiently flexible to deal with each situation on its own merits. Um, you wanted to provide guidance for, you, for yourself as well as for your employees. So be open, be prepared, and 
and just communicate as much as you can. You want to stay, um, you know, within the parameters of, of the Health and Safety Act as well. And just, I think, most important is let's bear in mind this is a constantly changing landscape. So stay up to date with any information that comes uh, from the Ministry of Health as well. And lastly, and I'm sure a lot of you have really, uh, are, this will be a big concern for you, is how do you recession proof your business? And um, I feel like this is a topic we'll touch on it very lightly today, but it's probably something that I think we need to do. And I certainly have a lot more conversation about going forward. But just a couple of quick things that I'd like to share with you is, um, we know the risks. We can't afford to put our head in the sands. We need to protect our business. This is really an uncertain um, economy. I don't think anybody saw this, certainly not six months ago. Nobody saw this coming. Um, so whether this virus leads to a recession or not, the best time to be planning for a recession, if you haven't already done so, is today. Cash flow is king. It's really important to manage this closely. Constantly be thinking of ways to move your current stock to keep your momentum um, going. Using a, flash, a cash flow forecasting tool can be a really good idea. Speak to your bank. Uh, I know Westpac has some excellent tools up on their web, website and they are offering some assistance to their clients during this period as well. So communicate whether you're at Westpac or you're with another financial institution. Ring them up, find out what is available to you. There's certainly some pressure on supply chains, so um, you may want to be looking at where you can purchase some extra stock to be keeping that going, but make sure that you don't have too much money tied up in stock as well, because you need to move that to, to free that money up again. Focus on products which you know are going to sell well, which you know have got some good margins in, while you can still get them. And bear in mind that this uncertainty um, is likely to put a, pressure, a bit of pressure on some supply and demand. So I think we could potentially see see the price of goods go up there as well. Spend some time examining your inventory or your stock management practices. If you have some old surplus stocks, find ways that you can move them. Um, if, see if you can find some alternative uh, vendors. In the current situation, like I said, supply and demand is certainly something um, that you need to be thinking about in your planning there as well. There are plenty of ways to cut costs in your business. And again, involve your team. Um, involving your team really gets that engagement going. They'll have some great ideas and they sometimes see things that you don't. So engage them, encourage them to share some of the ideas and that, that they have with you. Master your competencies. It's never a bad idea to diversify your small business, but simply adding products or services for the sake of doing something new is not necessarily the best strategy, particularly when times are tough. So even during an economic boom, attempts to break into new sectors can really actually damage your core operation. So maybe now is the time to stick to your knitting. Focus on being the absolute best at what your business already does well. Don't forget your customers. Um, people who are already buying from you are the best place for you to market to. Be talking to them. Um, you know, think about um, what it is that you can offer them. Your existing customers are familiar with your company. Um, and some of your loyal clientele are likely to be more open to upselling. And again, if your staff isn't trained in, in upselling, now certainly be the time to, to having a look at that and seeing what education is available. We can certainly here at Retail NZ help you with some of that as well, uh, running short workshops or things that can just maybe give your staff that little bit of an edge. And it's also significantly cheaper to market to people who are already purchasing from you. Another thing to think of is keep an eye on what your competition is doing. Recession proofing is all about finding ways to expand to exp expand your customer base. Whether you're in a niche or a mainstream market, you'll want to steer the wider customer base in your direction. So keep an eye on what others are doing. Sign up for their email lists, visit their stores, check out their social media pages. Um, keep tabs on what they're doing and be thinking about what are the things that you can do to separate your business. If you haven't thought about that, now really is the time to be thinking about what is your point of difference. 
Never give up or stop marketing your business. Um, if consumers don't know about your business, they can't do business with you. A lean market provides you with an opportunity to distinguish yourself from other businesses by emphasizing your product or your service. Certainly keep up your paid marketing efforts, as well as be thinking about other less expensive routes that you can take. Social media is a great one. Uh, here at Retail NZ, we run a really great um, social media marketing course. It's a one-on-one course, but if you're not up to speed with that, it would be a really a good investment for you at this time. Social media is inex inexpensive and can be really, really effective, but you do need to know how to get that right. So certainly be talking to us about that as well. And we'll soon have some more um, information for you about how to um, focus your marketing in a downturned economy. And lastly, just a reminder to this is time to be thinking about your own personal credit score. Very good idea for you to be keeping that as healthy as you possibly can. Um, in a tough economy, uh, it's quite, it can be quite difficult to secure some additional capital if you need that. So that is certainly something to be uh, keeping an eye on. And right now, that's really enough um, from me. Um, Ashley, at this point, we certainly have quite a few uh, questions that have come in here. So we'll take a few minutes and see if we can answer some of those. Hi everyone, thanks for all your questions. It's great to see those come through. Um, now I do realise that we're running a bit over time, so if we don't um, get to address all of those, we will send um, those answers out in the FAQs. Uh, now one question that has come through, which I am seeing quite a bit of, so I did want to touch base on that. Um, so this has come through from Sharon, and Sharon has asked, can I reduce my employees' hours due to a downturn in business? Okay, um, so yes you can, but it is essentially restructuring. So a workplace change process needs to be followed um, in this situation. So this is going to involve consulting with any affected employees. Um, what you would need to do is put your proposal to your employees, um, supported by evidence that support a downturn in your business, and the employees would then need time to um, go away, seek advice and information uh, before providing you with feedback um, and making suggestions, which you would then need to take into account before confirming an outcome. Okay, um, so some other options that you may want to explore um, before a business change process uh, could be discussions with staff around voluntary reduction in hours um, or potentially using annual leave as well. Uh, so we would advise open communication with all your employees during um, times like this. Uh, you never know what's going to come up, but they may, may bring up options for you that you hadn't already considered. Okay, um, now we have run out of time, so we will get back to you on those other questions, but I'll just pop you back over to Natalie to um, finish up the session. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And yes, absolutely, we've got quite a raft of questions that have come through, and we will definitely answer these in as much detail for you as we can, and that should be emailed out to you before this week is over. So um, yeah, just really thank you for to all of you, uh, we really just appreciate um, the generosity of, of your attention. And um, just again, just a reminder that, um, sorry, just move that out of the way. Um, yep, yeah, please do remember we've got for our members, we do have the um, advice line. That number again is 0800 472 472, or you can email us at events at retail doc, doc Kiwi. Um, so thanks very much, everybody, and yep, you'll be hearing from us again shortly.